The Governance of China, Volume 2, by Xi Jinping, Audiobook, Part 21. Beautiful China. Promote ecological progress and reform environmental management. October 26, 2015. Part of the speech, Explanation of the Recommendations of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China for the 13th Five-Year Plan for Economic and Social Development at the 5th Plenary Session of the 18th CPC Central Committee. Dual Control of Energy, Water Resources, and Construction Land we must take effective measures to promote ecological progress and address growing resource constraints, serious environmental po pollution, and ecological degradation, and be pragmatic and solid in our work so as to achieve results. Dual control is an effective measure. It means putting a ceiling on both the total amount and the intensity of energy use, water consumption, and construction land utilization per unit of GDP. If we can ensure the success of the ceiling, we will save energy and water and land resources, reduce pollutant emissions at the source, force the transformation of the growth model, and raise the level of the green economy. The intensity of energy consumption per unit of GDP was taken as a binding indicator for the first time in the 11th five-year plan, 2006 to 2010. The 12th five-year plan, 2011 to 2015, decided to rationally control energy consumption. As it stands now, these decisions have proved to be both necessary and effective. Considering the grim situation in terms of our resources and environment, we should continue to apply dual control over energy consumption, expand it to water resources and construction land, treat it as a binding indicator, establish a target responsibility system, and clarify and assign responsibilities in a rational way. We should also explore the establishment of a market-based dual control mechanism, a budget management system, and a system of compensated use and trading, and strive to exercise dual control with more use of the market. The pilot project of crop rotation and fallow land system. After long-term development, the exploitation of arable land in China is too intense. In some places, a serious decline in land fertility, water, and soil erosion, over-exploitation of groundwater, soil degradation, and non-point source pollution have become prominent problems that constrain the sustainable development of our agriculture. Domestic grain stocks are currently high, which has led to heavy warehousing subsidies. In addition, the international market has seen falling grain prices, which have dropped below the production cost in domestic market. The crop rotation and fallow land system should be adopted in some places when grain supply is abundant both at home and abroad. This will, benef this will be beneficial to land restoration, sustainable agricultural development, balancing grain supply and demand, stabilizing rural income, and reducing financial pressure. In implementing the crop rotation and fallow land system, we can focus on pilot projects in groundwater funnel areas and areas of heavy metal pollution and serious ecological degradation in accordance with the financial resources available and food supply and demand. Arrange for certain areas of arable la land to lie fallow and give the required food or cash subsidies to the farmers concerned. In carrying out this pilot program, we should make sure that national food security and the incomes of farmers are not affected. This program should not reduce the arable land area, divert it to non-agricultural purposes, or weaken China's overall agricultural production capacity, but rather it should ensure that there will be adequate output and supply in time of need. 
At the same time, we must ensure that agriculture goes global more quickly and domestic farm produce must increase. Since the crop rotation and fallow land system is complicated, we must first carry out pilot programs. The system that places the monitoring, supervision, and law enforcement activities of environmental protection bodies below the provincial level under the leadership of environmental bodies at the next level up. Serious pollution to the environment, especially to the atmosphere, water, and soil, has become an, an apparent threat to the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects. It is people's earnest wish to stop environmental deterioration and improve the quality of the environment. It is also an important goal of the 13th Five-Year Plan, 2016 to 2020, to which we must attach great importance and which we must effectively promote. The existing block-based local environmental management system has led to the following consequences. Some places value development far above environmental protection and intervene in the monitoring and supervision over law enforcement by environmental protection agencies. As a result, it is difficult to implement the environmental protection responsibility system or laws are not properly observed or strictly enforced or lawbreakers are not prosecuted by some local regions and government agencies. To sum up, the existing environmental protection system has failed to address the following four difficulties. The difficulty in implementing its supervisory responsibility over local governments and the relevant departments. The difficulty in preventing the interference of local protectionism in the monitoring and scrutiny of law enforcement. The difficulty in adapting to the new requirement of coordinating and addressing cross-region and cross-basin environmental issues and the difficulty in regulating and strengthening local environmental protection bodies. The system that places the monitoring, supervision, and law enforcement activities of environmental bodies below the provincial level under the leadership of environmental bodies at the next level up is mentioned in the recommendations. It includes the following key provisions. Provincial environmental protection agencies directly manage the monitoring and scrutiny agencies at city, prefectural, and county levels and bear their personnel and work expenses. City, prefectural level environmental protection bureaus follow a dual management system with provincial level environmental protection departments, bureaus, taking the lead and... County-level environmental protection bureaus are no longer independent but are detached offices of environmental protection bureaus at the city prefectural level. All this is a major reform of China's environmental management system, which is conducive to enhancing the unity, authority, and effectiveness of environmental law enforcement. We will promote this reform nationwide on the basis of pilot programs and endeavor to complete the task before the end of the 13th five-year plan period. Eco-environmental protection is an integral component of development. August 24, 2016, part of a speech during a visit to Qinghai province. It is high time that we intensified eco-environmental protection and we are capable of accomplishing this task now. On the one hand, eco-environmental problems that have accumulated over years of rapid development are prominent, generating much public discontent. Ecological destruction and pollution affect both sustainable, economic, and social development and public health. It is an outstanding issue that needs to be addressed with great effort. On the other hand, we now have the resources and capabilities to solve this problem. In the past, due to low productivity, we had to reclaim land from forest 
grassland, and sea to increase grain output, but since our people now have adequate food and clothing, eco-environmental protection should and must become an integral component of development. Clear waters and green mountains are invaluable assets. November 28, 2016. Comments on Ecological Progress. Ecological progress is an important component of our overall approach to building socialism with Chinese characteristics and the four-pronged strategy. All regions and departments should diligently implement the new development concepts, be fully aware that clean waters and green mountains are invaluable assets, and make every effort to usher in a new era of ecological development under the socialist system. Reform for ecological progress should be driven to a new level, and a pertinent institutional framework should be set up as soon as possible, providing functional mechanisms buttressed by the rule of law. By introducing supply-side structural reform, we will speed up China's development in a green, circular, and low-carbon fashion, and make our work and our daily life less resource-reliant and more environment-friendly. Emphasis will be put on the supervision of environmental crimes and violations of party discipline and the law in relation to environmental protection will be handled accordingly. We will focus our strength on pressing environmental problems so that the public will see noticeable improvement in the ecological environment. Party committees and governments at all levels, along with other relevant bodies, must treat ecological progress as an important task, take solid steps to tackle difficult issues, and be persistent and pragmatic to achieve concrete results. They must make sure that the decisions and plans of the Party Central Committee on Ecological Development are thoroughly implemented and strive to contribute to a better environment for a beautiful China and to global ecological safety. Green Development Model and Green Way of Life May 26, 2017 Main Points of the Speech at the 41st Group Study Session of the Political Bureau of the 18th CPC Central Committee. Promoting the green development model and a green way of life is an essential requirement of our new development concepts. We must give top priority to ecological progress in our overall plan, follow the basic state policy of resource conservation and environmental protection, and give high priority to saving resources, protecting the environment, and promoting its natural restoration. We must develop a resource-saving and eco-friendly land utilization planning system, industrial structure, mode of production, and way of life. We should strive for the coordinated development and common progress of the economy, society, and environmental protection and create a good environment for our people to work and live in. Humanity must respect, protect, and stay in harmony with nature in its development activities, otherwise nature will take its revenge. This is a law that everyone should observe. Humanity relies on nature, and the relationship between the two is one of symbiosis. Harm to nature will eventually hurt humanity. Only by following the law of nature can we effectively avoid going astray in our exploitation and utilization of nature. Since the introduction of reform and opening up in 1978, our achievements in social and economic development, of which we are rightly proud, have been historic. At the same time, however, many environmental problems have arisen. These problems have become prominent deficiencies and have become pressing concerns to the public. We must redouble our efforts to address them. Promoting the green development model and a green way of life, 
represents a profound revolution in people's mindset on development. This requires us to adopt and implement the new development concepts and strike a proper balance between economic growth and environmental protection. We should protect the ecosystems as preciously as we protect our eyes and cherish it as dearly as we cherish our lives. We must be resolute in casting aside the growth model that harms or even destroys the environment and in abandoning the practice of development at the expense of the environment for temporary economic growth in certain localities. The protection and improvement of the ecosystems will help improve quality of life, sound and sustainable social and economic development, and present an image of an environmentally friendly China. We should strive to build a beautiful China where skies are blue, mountains green, and waters lucid. We must be aware that it is an important, pressing, but difficult task to adopt the green development model and a green way of life. We must place it high on our agenda and speed up the building of a national, appropriate, and well-designed plan for land use. An industrial system for green, circular, and low-carbon development, a complete supporting system for ecological progress which attaches equal importance to incentives and restraints, and an environmental governance system jointly implemented by the government enterprises and the public. We will speed up our work on drawing three red lines for protecting the ecosystems, covering ecological function security, basic environmental quality standards, and natural resource utilization. We will step up environmental protection in all respects, in all places, and in all the processes of production, distribution, and consumption. In regard to promoting the green development model and a green way of life, I want to propose the following six key tasks. First, accelerate the shift of the economic growth model. To fundamentally improve the ecosystems, we must abandon the model based on an increase in material resource consumption, extensive development, high energy consumption, and high emissions. We should rely on innovation to pursue a more innovation-driven development which is oriented towards the future and gives full play to first-mover advantage. This is an important part of supply-side structural reform. Second, Intensify the comprehensive control of environmental pollution. We will resolve the pressing problems of air, water, and soil pollution on a priority basis and redouble our efforts in environmental pollution prevention and control. We will carry out the action plan on air pollution prevention and control, strengthen water pollution prevention and control, conduct soil pollution control and soil restoration projects, reinforce prevention and control of widespread pollution in agriculture, and intensify comprehensive environmental governance in urban and rural areas. Third, accelerate environmental protection and restoration. We must prioritize conservation and promote natural restoration, carry out an integrated program of protection and restoration for mountains, waters, forests, farmlands, and lakes, launch large-scale land greening campaigns, and step up comprehensive control of soil erosion, desertification, and stony desertification. Fourth, Promote all-round resource conservation and efficient resource utilization. Environmental problems in the final analysis are caused by overexploitation, inefficient utilization, and wasteful consumption of resources. We exploit and utilize natural resources to guarantee a happy life for the people, but at the same time, we should leave to our future generations sufficient resources for their needs. We should establish a mindset of conserving, recycling, and efficiently using resources and strive to obtain maximum social and economic benefits at a minimum cost in resources and environment. Fifth, advocate and popularize 
green consumption. Ecological progress is a matter for everyone. Each of us should pursue and advance ecological progress. We should enhance publicity and education on the need to promote ecological progress and raise environmental consciousness among the people, encourage them to develop a green way of life and a consumption model characterized by economy, moderate consumption, and low carbon, and foster a social trend in favor of eco-conservation. Six. Refine the overall mechanism for ecological progress with complete supporting systems. To promote green development and guarantee ecological progress, it is imperative to have the strictest possible institutions and legislation in place. We must improve the natural resource assets management system, strengthen natural resources and environmental regulation, implement environmental inspections and an eco-compensation system, and refine the system of public participation in the protection of the environment. Officials have a key role to play in implementing eco-conservation programs. We must implement an eco-conservation responsibility system for officials during their tenure of office and an audit of natural resource assets when they leave their posts. We must clearly identify in accordance with laws and regulations the items for which officials at all levels are to be held accountable throughout their lifetime. In doing so, we will follow the principles of objectivity and fairness, rational conclusions, and balance between power and responsibility. Any official responsible for damage to the environment must be held accountable. All party committees and governments must attach great importance to this and provide stronger leadership. Party discipline inspection commissions and organization departments, together with the government's oversight agencies, must assume their responsibilities and join efforts to form a synergistic force. Carry forward the spirit of Sai Han Ba, a model in afforestation. August 14, 2017 Comment on the exemplary deeds of the workers of Saihan Ba Forest Farm, Hebei Province. In response to the call of the party, the workers of Saihan Ba Forest Farm of Hebei Province have dedicated themselves to hard work over 55 years in a desert where the sun and the sky are shaded by yellow sandstorm and flying birds find no trees for shelter, and have finally created a miracle by turning wasteland into forests. Through their actions, they have made manifest the idea that green hills and clear waters are as valuable as gold and silver. They have forged a Sai Han Ba spirit, of bearing the mission in mind, working hard, and pursuing green development. Their dedicated efforts and moving stories serve as a model in our drive for ecological progress. Our whole party and all of society must adhere to the idea of green development and carry forward the Sai Han Ba spirit. We need to work on this for generations to come, persevere in our efforts, and strive to create a new pattern of harmonious development between mankind and nature. In so doing, we will build our country into a more beautiful land and leave to future generations a beautiful environment of blue skies, green mountains, and clean waters. Military Development Strengthen and improve the political work of the military. October 31st, 2014, part of the speech at a military conference on political work. Currently, both China and the world are experiencing a period of dramatic and complex change. Aware of fundamental differences of opinion in the ideological sphere, we must be on the alert 
against any possibility of a color revolution. There must on no account be any weakening of our efforts in the arduous task of preparing for combat readiness, in meeting the challenges of reforming national defense and the army, and in continuing the army's political work. The direction of the party is the direction of the military's political work. The military's political work is determined by the central task of the party and the military in the current era. The contemporary theme of our military's political work is to focus on realizing the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation and provide a solid political guarantee for achieving the party's goal of building the military. The military must follow the guidance of Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, the theory of three represents, and the scientific outlook on development, and implement party central committee's requirements of comprehensively promoting the rule of law and strict party discipline within the military. Political work in the new era should be strengthened and improved so that it can play its part as the lifeline in building our military. Once the key link is grasped, everything else falls into place. Once the horse is before the cart, the cart will follow. Footnote 1. Yang Chuan, Discourse on Truth and Matter, Wu Li Lun. Yang Chuan was a philosopher during the Western Jin Dynasty, 265-317. to End of footnote 1. What is crucial at this point is to build on the following four fundamentals. First. The military should foster our shared ideals and convictions. The essence in leadership is to lead the hearts and minds. Footnote 2. Su Shun. Collected Essays in the Jiayou Period. Jiayou Ji. Su Shun, 1009-1066, was a writer of the Northern Song Dynasty. End of footnote 2. Lofty ideals and firm convictions are the soul of revolutionary forces, the decisive factor to win victories and the means to ward off any corruption and moral decline. We must take the fostering of ideals and convictions as a strategic project and take effective measures to consolidate the foundation of our values. To foster ideals and convictions is part of the education of the people. We should adapt ourselves to the objectives and requirements of building our military and the characteristics and laws of political work to foster a new generation of revolutionary forces dedicated to the party's ideals and leadership, capable of winning wars, fearless and equipped with moral integrity. The military should equip itself with our party's theories, uphold and apply the core socialist values, foster the values of contemporary revolutionary forces, and inspire the troops so that our ideals and convictions and great traditions will go down from generation to generation. I have always believed that the key to building up ideals and convictions is high-ranking officers. One of the major challenges is a lack of trust by the rank and file in some commanding officers, especially senior officers. To a certain extent, a crisis of belief reflects a crisis of confidence, a lack of belief on the part of commanding officers. A key factor for the rank and file to have a belief is for the commanding officers to have one and act accordingly. All of us here at this meeting bear a heavy responsibility. All members of the military are looking to us. As long as all of us present today sincerely believe in Marxism and truly love the party, the country, the people, and the military, as long as we adopt an unequivocal approach towards major issues of principle, remain dauntless when facing political storms, firmly resist all kinds of temptation, remain pragmatic with firm and sincere aims, are bold in shouldering our responsibilities, and lead by example, we will be able to accomplish our goals in fostering our ideals and convictions in the military. Second, 
The military should uphold party spirit and principles. Belief in party spirit and principles is the fundamental quality of party members, as well as the fundamental requirement of our political work. In doing our work, we must put the principles and cause of our party and the interests of our people first. As party members, we must love the party, protect the party, work for the party, and share weal and woe with the party. Criticism and self-criticism serve as an effective instrument for upholding party spirit and principles and resolve intra-party conflicts and problems. One of the significant outcomes of the campaign to implement the party's mass line is the restoration of this worthy tradition. If no one dares to criticize others and no one is willing to criticize himself, problems and conflicts will pile up and be aggravated. Eventually, an ailment will become incurable. We should consolidate wholesome conduct, engage in positive, healthy criticism and self-criticism, and build a confident ethos of unity with a clear distinction between right and wrong, between merit and fault. Intra-party activities are political activities with strong principles. Their main purpose is to solve problems. We must be resolute in opposing the acquiescent mentality and inappropriate tendencies. According to ancient Chinese sayings, proper execution of orders is the making of a majestic military. Footnote 3. Liu Xiang, Garden of Stories, Shou Yuan. Liu Xiang, 77 to 6 BC, was an economist and writer of the Western Han Dynasty. End of footnote 3. And, Setting up rules beforehand outweighs punishment afterwards. Footnote 4. Wei Liao Zhe, an ancient Chinese text on, mi on military strategy. End of footnote 4. The key to upholding party spirit and principles is to set up rules, apply them fairly, and abide by them. There should be clear rules on what can be done and how, and what cannot be done. We should enhance our ability to implement rules and make sure that rules and discipline are a deterrent. The routine investigation and prosecution of violations of the law and discipline should be institutionalized so that our party members and military officers are prudent in mind, word, and deed. At the fourth plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee, I emphasized the importance of obeying political discipline and rules. I listed seven major problems. For the military to obey discipline, the priority is political discipline. To obey rules, the priority is political rules. And we must do so to a higher standard and set of requirements. Nobody is entitled to cross red lines of political discipline and rules. Those who do will have to pay a price. Upholding party spirit and principles is the responsibility of each and every member, each and every party member, and military officer. Commanding officers should hold firmly to the truth, adhere to principles, and courageously fight against violators and violations of party spirit and principles. All party committees should support and protect party members and officers who speak the truth and fight against misconduct. This way, clandestine rules will give way to a wholesome and favorable political environment. Third, the military should uphold the standard of combat capability. The essential function of our military is fighting. The standard of combat capability is the sole fundamental standard in building a military. Political work is a tool to guarantee the standard of combat capability in every aspect of military affairs. The focus should be on the capability to fight and win. The evaluation system of the performance of party committees and commanding officers should be improved in order to create a favorable environment 
for improving combat capability. We must introduce effective measures and relevant policies in public opinion, daily activities, and official promotion so as to establish a rigorous high standard of combat capability. For our military, political work itself plays a very important part in the creation and deployment of combat capability. Political work is part and parcel of combat capability. Without it, combat capability will be diminished. It is wrong to separate the two or regard them as conflicting opposites. Political work in the military must help us accomplish the central task of economic development and serve the overall interests of the country. We must put an end to the abnormal practice of political departments setting the agenda, going through daily routines, and evaluating their own performance behind closed doors, devoid of any consideration for real military needs. According to the overall requirement of winning local wars in the information era, we should put political work at the service of combat capability building and ensure it can play its part in the whole process of combat readiness. We should keep pace with deeper reform and carry out targeted political work. We should educate members of the military to have firm ideals and convictions and a strong sense of responsibility and discipline. All should advocate, support, and participate in reform and contribute to its success. Fourth, the military should uphold the authority of political work. To be frank, due to existing problems, the authority of our military's political work has been damaged, seriously in some cases. As an old saying goes, an authority that is not strong enough destroys itself. A rule that is not clear enough damages itself. Footnote 5. Lu Jia, New Thoughts, Xin Shu. Yu Jia, circa 240 to 170 BC, was a thinker and statesman of the Western Han Dynasty. End of footnote 5. Now the pressing task is to rebuild the authority of political work and restore some fundamental principles, including matching one's words with deeds, playing an exemplary role, and setting good examples. In the past, the military's political work featured good examples. During the Red Army period, 1927 to 1937, political work was the responsibility of party representatives who enjoyed a high reputation. Luo Rong Huan, footnote 6. Luo Rong Huan, 1902 to 1963, was a proletarian revolutionary strategist and marshal of the PRC. End of footnote 6. Once recalled during military marches, our party representatives marched at the end of the file, offering assistance to the soldiers in need. Party representatives had the support of the troops. Any written order had to bear their signature, otherwise the troops would doubt its authenticity. Footnote 7. Luo Rong Huan. The Gu Tian meeting and the political work of our military. Selected military works of Luo Rong Huan. Chinese edition, Chinese People's Liberation Army Publishing House, Beijing, 1997. Page 551. End of footnote 7. The exemplary role of political work officers is itself the best of political work. Today, as times change, we have a variety of methods for political work. However, the exemplary role is not outdated. Our troops do not care about what you say. They care about what you do. Rebuilding the authority of political work starts with the exemplary role, especially that of commanding officers. We should boost the morale of the military with role models, promote officers for their excellent performance, and sanction those who have failed. We should encourage officers of all ranks, especially political work officers, to put the power of truth together with the power of their personalities, to be pragmatic 
and to be fair and honest. In this regard, the Central Military Commission, CMC, should set a good example for the military.